During the Victorian era, the home began to be seen as a safe haven from the world. Unfortunately for the Victorians, many of the comfort items with which they filled their homes turned into death traps. Well, hello there. I'm Christina, and you're listening to History and Hearsay. During the 19th century, the cost of necessities fell dramatically. The development of new techniques for mass production made goods more available and affordable than ever before. Cities began expanding to house the growing middle classes, who over a 50-year period had grown from 2.5 million to over 9 million. No longer were people only extremely wealthy or desolate poor. Mass production had essentially created the middle class as we know it today. And for the first time, the Victorian middle classes were now able to enjoy a level of luxury that had only ever been available to the ultra wealthy. And most of this was seen with the level of comfort people were able to start having in their homes, from gas lighting to children's toys and decor. The home became a place where they could shut out the grim perils of the Victorian factory life and the overcrowded streets. This new urban middle class took immense pride in their homes. Along with these new inventions, there were also things that had been around for many years, but thanks to mass production, were now readily available in bulk people began to become consumers at a higher rate than had ever been seen before. And for the first time in history, the term standard of living was used and people began to judge how good their lives were by how much stuff they had. And while people seemed more than happy to stuff their homes with as much as they possibly could, they didn't buy just any old thing. No, 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 no. For the Victorians, there were household guides, magazines, and influential people who told them what was and what was not acceptable to buy. In my last video, we talked about Mrs. Beaton's Household Management Guide, and that book was one of the big influences of this time. Making the right choices was of high importance because the Victorians tied having good taste directly into having good morals. So basically, if someone came into your home and you were doing something that was advised against in these household guides, they would assume that you had bad morals. But while the Victorians fretted about fashion sense being a form of good character, they were oblivious to the hidden killers they themselves were bringing into their homes. While the Victorians were rejecting the idea of 18th century classism, they wanted clutter and color and excess. If you had tons of decor oozing from every surface in your home, then you must be doing well. The white walls of the 18th century became a thing of the past, and one thing in particular that indicated good taste and status was wallpaper. The richer the pattern and the darker, more vivid the color, the better. Because of the introduction of gas lighting, this was the first time in history that ordinary people had enough light in their homes to really be able to see and enjoy color. And the Victorians were here for it. This period was basically a wallpaper craze. There were manuals, including the very popular one called the Star Guide. There was also the Castles Guide, which told people which patterns and colors they should go for. And the wallpaper industry went from 1 million pieces sold in 1834 to 32 million pieces sold by 1874. Many of the guides recommended the color green, calling it tranquil and saying that colors like yellow and red were the preferences of robust men from savage nations. Not sure what they had against red and yellow, but there was this one particular shade of green known as shield green that was all the rage. Now, this shade of green was named after its inventor, a Swedish scientist by the name of Carl Scheele, who had first mixed the pigment to produce an intensely vivid color that did not fade. It was so popular that it was used on everything from carpets to candles and even children's toys. But most of all, it was used in industrial quantities in wallpaper. And the strangest things started to happen. As wallpaper sales escalated, so did reports of unexpected deaths and illnesses in the home. And of course, there really was nothing mysterious about it because the magic ingredient that was giving the wallpaper its rich green hue was arsenic. These were samples of what would be considered as tasteful wallpapers to have in a Victorian home. This on the walls would have been loaded with arsenic, actually in the printing of the book. 
it's also used arsenical dyes. With modern science, we can now prove that Victorian wallpaper contained arsenic, but this danger wasn't fully understood back at that time. To confuse things even further, the symptoms of arsenic poisoning were very familiar. Symptoms of arsenic poisoning were very similar to cholera. The immediate effects would be of pain, swelling of the esophagus, very dry throat and difficulty in swallowing. And then what's described is agonizing abdominal pains as the whole um, digestive tract is affected by the arsenic. Vomiting, diarrhea, and sounds terribly unpleasant, and then people would die, which was said to be quite a relief because it's such an agonizing way to die. As mysterious illnesses and death continued to be reported, eventually the connection was made to arsenic in the second half of the 19th century. The newspapers were full of these types of stories, like the one of a six-month-old child who died as a result of chewing on a piece of emerald green wallpaper. Of course, the ordinary person wasn't going around eating wallpaper, but that didn't mean that they were safe. Wallpaper was endangering the health of an entire nation in a much less avoidable way. Thanks to a chemical reaction, poisonous fumes were thought to have infiltrated the very air that they were breathing. Pieces of the surface of the wallpaper could also come off and the house would then be covered in arsenical dust and because Victorian homes were not centrally heated this also meant the homes were often full of damp air which together with the wallpaper paste and cellulose which was on the wallpaper itself this caused fungal growth and the fungi mixed with the arsenic on the wallpaper was highly toxic for the Victorians who were breathing it in on a daily basis. Because of the smog in the cities, the windows of these homes were very rarely opened, and so these homes never really got a chance to air out. And when it comes to arsenic, it doesn't matter if you breathe it in, absorb it through your skin by touching it, or whether you've actually eaten it, the effects are pretty much the same. It travels via the bloodstream, and once it's in the blood, it goes all over your body. But another issue was that if you're being poisoned very slowly by arsenic, like you're just being exposed a little bit, over a long period of time, the symptoms you would get were kind of vague. And so people were exposed maybe a little bit in one of their rooms and then they wouldn't be in that room for a little bit or they left their home to go on vacation or something like that. They would get better. And so the symptoms would kind of just come and go. And it was really hard for doctors at that time to just to determine what was even making them sick. Especially since, like we said, it was similar to many of the other illnesses that were common during that time. Now, as more and more mysterious deaths continued to happen, there were some doctors that began to question the use of arsenic in wallpaper. There appears good reason for believing that a very large amount of sickness and mortality among all classes is attributable to this cause, and that it may probably account for many of the mysterious diseases of the present day which so continually baffle all medical skill. The Lancet, which is a weekly peer-reviewed medical journal, began to report on these cases. And in 1856, a couple in Birmingham reported to their doctor, Dr. Hines, that they were suffering from inflamed eyes, headaches, and sore throat, and that even their pet parrot seemed to be real low energy and maybe sick as well. They decided to go on holiday to the seaside, and when they did, their symptoms completely disappeared. And this is when they began to suspect that maybe it was some something in their house that was making them sick and they had recently applied, you guessed it, bright green wallpaper to two rooms in their home. Dr. Hines wondered if maybe the wallpaper alone was completely responsible for them being sick. People went to the seaside and what effectively they were doing is moving out of a toxic environment into a healthy diluted environment where you had fresh air, water that came from a known source not relying on what was in a, a concentrated area within the property. Now what is really astounding is just how much arsenic there really was in the Victorian drawing rooms. When you add up all the materials that contained arsenic pigments, like on the walls, on the carpets, on the couches, on the toys, maybe some of the decor, all the different things, it's said that the average Victorian drawing room could have contained up to 2.5 kilograms of arsenic if you consider the fact that it only takes about 200 milligrams to be fatal for an adult. That means if I'm doing my math correctly, that this amount of arsenic would have really been enough to like 
kill thousands of people? That's pretty crazy. So Dr. Hines, along with some other medical practitioners, began to be very outspoken against the use of these arsenic pigments. In their mind, it was really making people sick and we just needed to get rid of it. Germany actually got with the program and they banned the use of arsenic and wallpaper, but the UK didn't fall in line. Wallpaper manufacturers didn't want people to think that there was anything wrong with their products. The Lancet and the British Medical Journal fought for a long time to bring these dangers to the public's attention, and there was a lot of dispute back and forth between the medical community and these wallpaper manufacturers. Some doctors and newspapers called on the British government to ban the poisonous wallpapers, but others were quick to belittle the claims of the killer wallpaper. Some manufacturers even went so far as to offer to eat their own wallpaper to prove that it was safe. Now, I don't know if any of them actually did it. I wish they would have. Well, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say that, but in a way I'm like, okay, do it then. You know, I doubt they did because if they did, then they would have found out that the people were right. One of Britain's most celebrated wallpaper designers was William Morris, and he was a leader in the arts and craft movement at that time. He was also known to be one of the fiercest critics of what he considered the heartless industrialists of that period. But What's not very well known about this champion of handicraft is that he was the director of the biggest arsenic producing mind in the world. William Morris was making his money from arsenic, which may come as a surprise to anyone who's familiar with him because he was known, like I said, as this leader in the arts and crafts movement and he championed going back to the natural ways of doing things. And during all this time, it was said that the arsenic produced in his mind was enough to kill the entire planet. Such a hypocrite. <laughs> I feel like we're always so surprised by this, but we really shouldn't be. There have been so many of these activists over the years who've proven themselves to be the worst offenders and whatever cause they're supposedly fighting for. Some of the people who came out with the processes had vested interests in other locations that they would own arsenic mines. They would own areas where it was in their interest to include arsenic into paints, dyes, Whatever. Now, we have no real records that William Morris ever acknowledged or admitted that his wallpaper was poisonous. The only thing we do have to tell us how he felt about it is his response to a customer complaint letter where the customer was saying that the wallpaper was poisoning him and his family. And William Morris's response was basically just to write back and say that the accusation was witch fever. I couldn't find an exact like definition of witch fever, but what I did find, this seemed to imply that being bitten by witch fever was some like Victorian era burn that was like essentially calling someone crazy. It was clear by William Morris's response. He was saying that the idea that his wallpaper was toxic was ludicrous. All right, who called for ludicrous? No, not you, Luda. Whether he really believed this was all Luda witch fever, or he was just worried about his bottom line, we may never really know. But because many of the leaders in this industry were really turning a blind eye, people began to believe that if there were gonna be any change, it had to come from the very top. And it did take someone at the top being affected by this for it to start to change. The, the key tipping points of that recognition was when Queen Victoria herself had had wallpaper of shield green. Um, and she had a, a diplomat who actually came to stay with her. The poor chap had actually killed over overnight because he was actually effectively poisoned by the arsenic in the wallpaper. She was a little skeptical about it, but then when it actually came out in the papers and there were actually quite a lot of publications around that time was actually that she'd done that. It was then that step change in maybe we need to think in how we regulate this. Now you might be surprised to learn that the use of arsenic in wallpaper was never officially banned. What happened was that once more and more customers started to understand the danger, they simply stopped buying it and the wallpaper companies were then forced to change what they were doing in order to sell their papers. You guys, 
buying power really is a thing. We really do tell companies what we want by what we spend our money on. And if you have an issue with something companies doing, it's really simple to let them know by pulling your support of their products. Morris Wallpapers and other popular manufacturers started to advertise that their products were arsenic free. And by 1872, even the popular star guides had switched to safer printing. Many Victorians were able to limit the exposure in time to prevent immediate death. We were still exposed to a level that eventually caused many chronic health problems, including cancers. We will never know how many people died a slow and painful death through the prevalence of arsenic in Victorian products. But if you'd like to hear other stories like these, you know it. <music>